Mug, February 2016. Always nice to be here. Well, uh, I was going to start off with this slide. There are details out there and the flyers out there. I'm hiring and I'm serious. Uh, I take the final decision. So uh, go, go up there. There are about three open positions, 2641, 2758, and 2745, with all very skill levels. Check it out. That's what the flyer looks like. That's on the table. So take one with you. And that's enough about uh, the jobs part here. So we we'll, uh, go to the next one. Let's get rid of this guy. You'll have to forgive me because I have to strain my neck to look at this. Here we go. So a little bit about where I work. These days I'm at Michigan State University and uh, about 10 years ago they started a new outfit called Institute for Cyber Enabled Research, which is a term that the National Science Foundation coined as it's not just high performance computing, but everything that goes underneath it, the whole infrastructure, high speed networking, high speed storage, all those kind of things. So. Uh, that was a, a much more open term, and they were funding uh, universities that said we'll do cyber enablement. Of course, the real thing is high-performance computing. I've talked about high-performance computing uh, at this forum many times in the past 25, 30 years, at least a couple of times. And basically, it takes whatever you do and makes it super fast. The other way we like to call it is we help you find whether your answers are wrong real fast. <laughs> Okay, so uh, really, uh, although uh, we are based at Michigan State University, uh, we do try to work across the campus with many groups, and these days uh, outside the campus as well. Uh, a little bit about the philosophy. Being compute, really it's all about doing a lot of number crunching, and uh, the way we measure that is how many floating point operations you can do. You know, calculate an equation, multiply this by this, and usually we don't care about the integer part, we want the floating point. And so as many thousands of those you can get, so K-flops, and then of course, I think maybe two years ago I talked about K-flops to megaflops to gigaflops and so on. And today we're going to hit the high end of the scale. But in any case, we want uh, folks that are doing any kind of research, not necessarily your physics, your chemistry, your engineering, but beyond that, and these days they come to us with a lot of big data. We've been doing big data for a long time, we just didn't call it by that fancy term. And so, uh, we've been growing also. Today, uh, we've got about three main clusters, over 7,000 cores, and a few machines with a, a huge amount of uh, RAM in it. It turns out, you've probably heard of this bioinformatics, you know, where they take your gene sequence or DNA sequence and then they try to figure out, oh, does it match this or that? It turns out that they're not very good programmers. So they write very simple linear code and uh, they don't know mem memory management techniques. So they say, can you get more memory? And they just load it with lots of memory to do RNA sequence, uh, DNA sequence matching. So we've got a few of those machines. We have a very, very fast, uh, shared or parallel file system called Luster, and that's about 1.7 petabytes of just scratch space, you know, like a slash <coughs> temp or something. And then we have almost 2,000, you know, different packages, and I questioned that number when I got there. I said, what the hell do you mean 2,000 packages? That's a lot. Oh, we have version 1.4, 1.5, 1.6. So, uh, all right. Well, uh, I've been there a little over four months, and so after figuring out what's the state of the state out there, we're going to start pruning all this stuff because we just cannot have software proliferation. It's just too much yet. Mm -hmm. um, but the real uh, strength is not just the powerful uh, machines ganged up together, but <coughs> a lot of the people out there, the skills that they bring, and we're growing. When they started, it was just like maybe three or four people. 10 years back, today we're 17. If I can get uh, more people. Oh, Echo. Can you fix that? Or? Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, okay, no problem. Testing, testing. I was. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it works. So, uh, okay, we're, we're uh, looking for, uh, to 
hire more people. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about what's coming down the road. It's going to grow as well. Um, these are the things that I actually shared that we, what does it consist of? We have tons of cores, sockets, each with a uh, uh, disk in it and running a flavor of Linux. For those of you who'd like to know, we run two flavors of Linux. On the pure compute side, we run CentOS. And then on the infrastructure support side, uh, like the filers or uh, things like that, we run Red Hat Enterprise uh, Linux up there. The reason we do that is so that we can focus on uh, CentOS compute and not have all those extra you know, services, but run it out there. As far as uh, scheduling all these thousands of programs, and I'll tell you some details later, we use uh, stuff from adaptive computing called Moab and Torque, and that's what we use. There's a little uh, YouTube there at the bottom that you can see out here. So whenever you feel like, I'll share the slides. By the way, this is true parallel processing. I got four slides. So it's not just one big gigantic one, you get to see it all. I told you why we use HPC, because uh, simply people say our resources aren't enough and so we just run it out there and right now on campus we're probably uh, the biggest single resource. So uh, we're planning a new data center and the first thing the IT folks, uh, we're not part of IT, we're part of research, they came to us said, you're going to be 50% of the floor space, so tell us what you need, and then we'll plan the rest. And uh, um, it turned out that it took them long to get their requirements all figured out. How many servers do we have? How many switches do we have? How many racks? And in the first half of our meeting, we told them exactly, this is our wattage, this is our cable, this is our trays, this is our racks, and we need this, 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 we need so many BTUs of cooling, and uh, after that, uh, we had to go to the weekly meetings just to make sure they didn't shortchange us and say, well, they're too much, so let's sneak them into a corner. We said, no, no, we want our 50% of the floor space. Uh, so uh, basically what we do is make uh, you know, people's computational research scale. So we're really at this far end of uh, this spectrum. Let me see if this pointer thing works. Yeah, there we are. So there's IT out there, plenty of servers, and our stuff is out here. When you combine all of this, we outrank them by simply the number of power draw. We take up half a megawatt, just us guys, and we've asked for one megawatt in the new data center with capacity to go to maybe one and a half megawatt, and that's just electrical server load. Then the cooling and stuff, that's separate, so they're trying to figure that out. So basically, you know, uh, I stole this slide from the Hadoop people because that's what people like to see. But basically, <laughs> we have tons of uh, nodes out there. You can run this. Really, Hadoop is nothing but uh, they took a lot of ideas from HPC and just used a lot of commodity hardware, and there you go. It works. Yeah. And uh, we do a lot of proposal writing to the DOE, DOD, National Science Foundation, the National Institute of Health and many other funding agencies. We have, uh, we run our own GitLab. There's a lot of software that we develop. And uh, we actually uh, go beyond Michigan State University. I purposely put this slide. Central Michigan University, instead of doing their own HPC, they said, we're just going to buy part of yours. Here's our money, and we'll take half a rack or whatever, and our researchers can use it. Well, then after they did that, uh, uh, Western Michigan said, okay, we'll take a chunk. We said, fine. And then uh, Kettering, which is up, up in Flint, they've just got a couple of nodes. Mm -hmm. But uh, they said, sure, you know, when we run out, we'll just buy more nodes. So we're hosting these guys. We do have a couple of external agencies. They happen to be located also up there, the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture. Uh, probably many of you know, or those who have relatives that went to Michigan State University, it started life as an agricultural college, and they have one of the best uh, programs uh, out there. Oh, you? Yeah, there you go. Thank you. No, I was going to ask a question. Uh, yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, so how much does it cost to rent some time on your systems? Um, we prefer that you actually buy a note, because then you can use it unlimited for four <coughs> years. 
So the benefit is they get to use the space that you have. In the yes, building. they don't have to pay for power the electric <coughs> power or the network access and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Or even hire people with expertise will run it for you. And so really if you think about it, it's just a few thousand dollars. And I'll leave it at that. But it's incredibly cheap. They did their own calculations. And they figured, well, we'll need to get this room and have the electricity. And it ran to several uh, things. It only made sense if they had a very large community. But they maybe have perhaps a couple of professors here, five out here, four out here. So for that small crowd, it makes sense to co-locate with us. Our own user community, and I'll show you stats about that, we have over 1,000 researchers. So it makes sense for us. And uh, that's an impressive number because when I was at General Motors, and Amit here will back me up, um, we had about 1,100 users and about the same size in terms of cores as well. So if you think about it, this is a pretty industrial uh, uh, strength here. Okay, so I'm done with that part. So let me get that out, and I'll entertain a question or two while I'm trying to get the next slide. All right, so what does our future look like? I want to use this to set the stage or context because then I will talk about what are the exciting technologies we're going to look at. And as you probably read in the description, um, whatever you see in the HPC today, tomorrow that's what becomes mainstream computing. Um, I can give you dozens of examples. I mean, today, Multi-core machines are pretty common. But maybe eight years ago, it was just a single little big socket chip, and that was it. But we've been doing multi-core for maybe the last 20, 25 years. So the stuff they learned, how to make you know the memory talk to it, how to make the cache coherent, all those wrinkles and things they ironed out. And then they said, well, we've got experience with this. Now let's shrink it and put it in the mainstream. So that was one example. Uh, Yes, Jeff. Oh, you had a question? Yeah. yeah. Um, I remember a while ago, not multi-core, but before multi-core, I remember multi-processor motherboards, which actually there's now multi-processor, multi-core motherboards. But um, how long ago does multi-core go back? OK. Um, I would say 1988. <clears throat> OK. Wow. And, and there are different Probably. issues with, when you say multiprocessor, the classical or traditional thing is that they have their own memory, they have their own peripheral pads and things, and there's another one with another processor, and they would do things locally on their own, they couldn't touch each other's. In multi-core, you're sharing common resources, peripherals, and the cache, and memory. And therefore, it was important that you don't, don't go and overwrite what another uh, core was working on. So those protocols are today baked in hardware, and that's what they you know spent time figuring out. So that's one example. Of course, uh, tons of software. Uh, many of the contributions of Unix itself, they were tried out here, and they uh, went forward. The one I uh, remember sharing maybe two years ago, uh, I was going to say, Probably all of you have at least half a dozen USB sticks of one shape or form the other. And really, if you think about it, it's nothing but solid state memory that's acting like a piece of disk. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out that in uh, late 1982-83, at that time, Cray Research, they made these fast vector processors, which are supercomputers. CPUs were very fast. They were very costly. One CPU was about a million dollars. <laughs> And uh, in those days, peripherals or disk drives, they were slow, they were big, and they were about the size of uh, gigantic uh, washing machines. So it was not unusual to have maybe a five gigabyte disk drive or something. And they had big copper platters, and they ran rather slow. And so they discovered that this expensive CPU is you know, twiddling its thumb. It can really write out the memory quickly to the disk, but the disk took time to write it out. 
So they said, how do we improve things? They said, why don't we take a piece of memory and stick it between the CPU and the disk? And uh, in Unix, we wrote a little 1,200-line uh, piece of C code as the device driver, which mimicked the functions of seek uh, and step and things that you do inside a disk drive, you know, position the head, things like that, open a file, close a file, put that. And so the operating system or processor thought, oh, I'm talking to a disk write this block of data, read this block of data, it would issue its command. In the kernel, it would intercept that system call and translate it to a piece of memory. And then once it says, I'm done, close the file, it would take that piece of memory, dribble it out to the hard drive. Well, today you can use that USB stick. It's nothing but a piece of memory. You can put it in there, and sometimes it's faster and it's more capacity. If you take a look at whatever operating system, you'll find that same 1200 line of C code. <laughs> Somebody wrote it once, wrote it in Unix, works in any other IX operating system because it had very fundamental semantics and it's there and we use it today. So that itself is one big contribution. I could reel off a few more. Um, graphics visualization. The way that works real fast is, oh, something must have kicked in, yeah trying to tell me to get on with it. <laughs> um, parallel I.O. When you uh, see you know, movies, Netflix, streaming, and things like that, they're really sending tons of bits together that it would grab as a packet and display. It all came from high-performance computing. So hopefully, the new stuff that they're doing in these, uh, let's say, two to four years, maybe it won't take that long to become mainstream. So let's talk about it. <coughs> But in order to talk about it, let me tell you why I went to Michigan State, because there's an opportunity to take what we have and grow it real big. So we actually have plans um, in 2016 to grow all of these out here, with the number one being compute, and uh, talk about what future HPC platforms are going to look like. So we started doing the planning for it, like day three that I got there. and. Uh, it's very important. In the past, what they did is the professor went and waved his hand and said, oh, this is cool, I want this, so they mm -hmm. bought it, but they found it hard to program or use, or there was no library, whatever, and so it sort of languished. I come from a very different world. I say, I'm not going to spend a dime or cent until I know whether the technology is viable, and I want to see what are people using, which is the biggest bottleneck for them up there. So that's what I call being uh, data-driven. And at the same time, look at new technologies that sort of match the kind of work that people are doing. And the goal is to make Michigan State, at least when it comes to this space within academia, certainly much higher on the food chain out there. So we're looking at uh, universities that are in the same shape or size as Michigan State, saying, OK, this is what you got. All right, we're going to do maybe not one better, not two better, but three better. So that once you pole vault a bit ahead, that momentum will actually help fuel the next generation growth. So that's the plan uh, that we've got going out there. And so all of these things are stuff we're going to worry about. Number one is the general purpose graphical processing units. This uh, I talked about last time. I even brought a little sample out there. It turns out that Whenever you're doing graphics, you're doing an awful lot of floating point calculations, you know, the color, intensity, shade, uh, ray tracing, all of that stuff that's going on, the pixels and things, lots of floating point calculations. So they built special purpose chips that understood the stuff that you do in graphics, and instead of your Intel or AMD or whatever CPU crunching away one instruction at a time, could take that entire chunk of data and send it to a special processor called an accelerator. And I'll call it, well, maybe not processor. I'll call it special hardware, which literally had hundreds of cores in it. And each core was geared to do floating point calculation very efficiently. The very first <laughs> generation of GPUs, I think it had about 100 cores that did floating point calculation very well. The next one, they jumped to 192, then 400, 
then to about 1900, uh, just a shade under 2000. The latest generation has on the same card size, you know, out here, same thermal envelope, it's nearly 4,000 cores. And one of the things we're looking at is taking your classical Intel, you know, uh, server motherboard, and then we're going to stick these accelerator cards with special PCI interfaces and use that full bandwidth and try to stuff it with as many GP GPUs, special library out there, so you write your program or take a program and then say when you want to do floating point calculation, put a special system call, it'll go to a library called CUDA library, C-U-D-A, uh, that understands all the instructions that this graphic accelerator can do for you. Grab the data out of the memory, shoot it across, do its calculation, and then send the data out to the next piece of memory or a graphics device. And the speed up is phenomenal, and we'll talk about that. Of course, a lot of people who use classical clusters. Yes? So um, I've, I've heard a bit about uh, this one um, brand name, NVIDIA, the NVIDIA GPUs. Yes. And I'm just curious if you can give us any, any idea of why that seems to be so important to some people. Well, because everything that I talked about, <coughs> that's what NVIDIA does. And uh, in the next uh, uh, last letter, uh, set of slides, you'll see why NVIDIA is right up there with the top three or four players in high performance computing. They're actually competing with Intel. Intel views them as their next competition, not AMD or anyone else. Uh, Cray and IBM, they're also uh, in the fray because there's tons of money involved in this and there are serious people putting down stuff and they seem to have the best story so far because they understood we need to accelerate. They make accelerator cards that take normal calculations and speed it up, you know, a thousand times. Now that is game changing no matter what domain you're in. And that's why uh, this is important. And NVIDIA, um, true story, NVIDIA actually uh, was a small company and there was another company called Silicon Graphics, SGI. They, in their infinite wisdom, which was wrong, but in their infinite wisdom said, we don't think there's much money in the graphics. It's just PCs and stuff. Mm -hmm. It's not much margin. So they took their 40, 50 uh, you know, team talented graphic chip designer and said, you guys were selling you to NVIDIA. We're focusing on servers, mm -hmm. business enterprise computing, etc." I would say that was one of the biggest mistakes Silicon Graphics made. They made a few, but that was one. So these guys, they moved to NVIDIA and they said, look, this is what we can do. They said, fine. They built the chips, supported them, and now they're like a hundred times more valuable than you know, the company they came from. And NVIDIA is very serious about this business. And uh, uh, the US government is pouring literally hundreds of millions of dollars, and they're one of the four teams competing. So we'll talk about that. But does that answer your question? Yes. As to why I enjoyed good. the story, too. Yeah, good. <laughs> and then, of course, uh, you know, it's not enough that we say, all right, we'll have lots of server nodes with sockets in there, and let's increase the core count. They're increasing also the memory because they're solving bigger, bigger problems. And so <coughs> they have to chop it up in little pieces. Even the little piece turns out to be big. So they have to have uh, nodes with large memory needs. And of course, the more cores, the better. I tell you, it doesn't matter how many cores I put out there, they seem to suck it up all. <laughs> we have utilization figures for those 7,000 cores are in the high 80s all the time. Wow. 80%. And uh, usually if you tell that to an IT guy that our utilization it rarely dips below 80, 76% is the lowest we've gone first thing they tell me is, well, you probably have no room for virtualization. <laughs> because the whole premise of virtualization that you're not using your server, you're using 30 40%, 40 to 60% is idle. Well, let's stick another virtual server, another virtual server. I said, no, we don't. We consume every bit of real estate. But it's not enough to have a fast accelerator, not enough to have lots of nodes in cluster, not enough to have large memory, not enough to have high core count. We need very fast access to that 
memory that we so the minimum that we look at is DDR4 and higher and we're looking at 24 gigahertz uh, channel speeds on the motherboards and that's the minimum we if we they, they could give us higher that would better the only place where memory speeds are higher than your classical uh, server board nodes are inside the GPU up there there we're talking well in excess of 2400 gigahertz clock speeds to fetch data, read data, write data. And let's not forget our spinning storage. Well, wherever we are in this uh, <coughs> stack, whether we're inside the GPU, inside the cluster or core, we need to write stuff out, generate gobs of it. We need to suck in gobs of it. And so we need to have you know access from anywhere. And so the software protocol layers are also an important part there. Uh, so just to give you an idea of how busy the system is, uh, I only have data for like a couple of years. In 2014, we ran just a shade under six and a half million individual calculations that were sent by these 800 different users in that year. And if you look, this really jumped to about nine million the subsequent year, and this year it's going to be well past that. Another way of looking at, well, you got, but all jobs are not the same size. They are big, small, small calculations, lots of calculations. Well, other way to look at it is uh, look at how many CPU hours were consumed. So that's, uh, what's that, 19 million out there? And then we added a little bit of hardware, it jumped to just a shade under 38 million. And with what we put in this year, it probably would exceed 50 million by, yeah. Yes? You know, what's what's the breakdown uh, approximately for the, the users? Uh, what percentages are using open source software, homegrown, and commercial? When they're running okay, here? that's a very good question. Could everyone get it? What's the distribution of software types amongst users? Um, the easy answer is all of the above. <laughs> we have, for example, uh, certain sections of the engineering <coughs> community. They tend to use third-party packages of computer-aided <coughs> engineering packages, like Fluent, ANSYS, NASTRAN, that were once upon a time, you know, developed by the government, and now they've commercialized it. So that would be maybe anywhere from 10 to 15 percent. Um, I'd say a big chunk, 40 percent, is open source. That is what other researchers have written, or they've written themselves, and then. Homegrown, uh, there are a few homegrown that they are developing, testing out, and they're not open source, but they're stuff that they've grown because their research is unique. They had to write it because open source did not fit their needs, and nobody in the commercial world had it. So that would be about maybe 20% uh, of that distribution. So it's really across the spectrum, which is good because all of these are growing, even the commercial codes. Uh, in open source. We use open source ourselves to run these clusters. I would say the percentage is very high, almost like 90%. The 10% that we actually pay for uh, is only because we don't have enough manpower. For example, like the scheduler. So we pay a little bit of money to adaptive computing. They take that open source, they add uh, you know, robustness to it and support, so if there's a bug, they'll fix it for us. And we do that because we just don't have enough manpower bandwidth. Larger sites than ours, they actually run their own scheduler, so they would be almost 100% open source, but ours is about 90%. And then most of the commercial high-performance computing, like General Motors, they run very little open source, maybe 5 to 10%, things like open foam or a few other packages. So. In our case, it's evenly distributed, which is good, because what that means is that whatever architecture we come up with, it can satisfy different uh, audiences, if you will. Okay. So uh, here's the growth in course. I, uh, I I like this kind of little snake ladder kind of uh, growth because what it shows that back in 2005, there was just a handful of users. Then for about three years, you know, there wasn't uh, much growth, and then suddenly it, it jumped up in 2010 and 11. Then again in 2014, you got more, and then what we're going to get in 2016 will probably have to change the scale. But 
We're certainly looking to go well past uh, 10,000 cores. Well past. Now, it might be 14,000, might be 17,000. I don't know. We're still practicing that. I mean, is that mostly due to machine replacement over? Because it looks like it follows a three-year cycle, which is usually a hardware replacement cycle. So is that is that?